Stuck in a mind-bending and time-warping clinic where horrifying experiments take place, the protagonist tries to find a way out, encountering scientists and healthcare professionals obsessed with selfish desires of fame and accomplishment, dismissing their vows in protecting and helping vulnerable patients. High and Wild Loophole is by far one of the best indie games to be ever released, with complex underlying social issues, twisted plotline, and complex characters which explores many horrifying real issues in a nightmarish style. The unnamed protagonist of the game finds himself thrown into a room from a higher level with collapsed floor, having surgical light seemingly having been part of a cruel experiment. Apart from the obvious, there's not much the protagonist remembers and understands apart from wanting to get out of this nightmarish place. The game starts with Dr. Randolph, the senior member of the clinic, speaking at a podium that, under his management, being newly instated, a new medical era and research will begin, where no one will ever die under his supervision. If that sounds ominous, it sure is, as we will soon learn about the lackluster efforts of Dr. Randolph truly caring about patients and simply wanting the glory in his accomplishment, performing cruel and inhumane experiments. After waking up from the fall from the upper floor, the protagonist awakens in what seems to be a series of storage rooms, where he meets Dr. Randolph himself, who in a reassuring manner informs the protagonist that he seems off and sweating profusely, and simply by following him to his office, he will find a way to help him. In here, the patient must be very obedient and follow Dr. Randolph step by step, as otherwise, Dr. Randolph will assume the patient as being uncooperative and and using sedatives, he puts him in the temporary prison. Awakening in the clinic's prison, the patient finds a document in one of the cells which entails how the previous senior practitioner, Dr. Frederick Erlenmeyer, was replaced by Dr. Randolph. Dr. Erlenmeyer seems to have been a widely respected and loved senior doctor who possibly had more humanity and compassion, replaced by a fame-hungry and research and science-driven person who wouldn't let anything get in his way of achievement and scientific breakthroughs. The strange prison has several locked doors with the patient having to open a heavily guarded and alarmed door to get to even a stranger grave-like place with surgical lines, which similarly to the beginning of the patient's journey throws him to the lower level back in the storage rooms where he has to repeat his encounter with Dr. Randolph in a seemingly perfect loop. The surgical lights soon reveal to be quick travel points which teleport the protagonist to different parts of the clinic. Repeating the same encounter with Dr. Randolph again, this time following him, he notes that one of the rooms has a massive cork plugging a hole in the wall, being reinforced with tapes. These hole plugs will be seen throughout the game and the clinic in different parts later on. Following Dr. Randolph to his office, he suddenly breaks his pretense and gets to the point, knowing there's no other place for the patient to run to or hide, explaining he doesn't even know this patient and has never met him before, depicting what a liar he is. He mentions that he's going to take the patient's liver before running to him and sedating him. Waking up on a hospital bed, having his liver removed, the speaker announces the instatement of Dr. Joseph Randolph as the new chief doctor, a role that had many applicants with Randolph mysteriously getting it despite not being as qualified as many other competitors. There clearly has been some foul play in the medical department or maybe his desires for conducting such controversial experiments convinced the seniors to give him this role. The patient then goes through an open air duct back to another set of surgical lights, teleporting him back to Randolph's section of the clinic. The patient at this point has to break the loop, thinking of a way to escape. Finding several syringes in one of the storage rooms, despite being used and emptied, he gets an idea to maybe he can find a sedative and inject Dr. Randolph in order to escape. That is exactly what the patient does, running from Dr. Randolph and hiding in a room where he finds a sedative, which he uses to stab Randolph with to knock him out. This allows the patient to steal his keycard and access another part of the clinic. 
The key allows the protagonist to enter the sick ward, a horrifying section where the vulnerable sick and terminal patients are kept being badly mistreated. The dirty and stained curtains and beds, including the hospital gowns the patients wear, coupled with the patients being in constant state of pain, neglect, and malnourishment, paints a sickening image of how the invisible patients are truly treated within the closed doors of Heilwild Clinicum. Navigating his way through the dirty and smelly maze of chaotically allocated hospital beds and curtains, the protagonist finds a crowbar and a wall plug reminiscent of what he saw earlier in Dr. Randolph's office, as if representing that secrets are hidden within this clinic and shouldn't leak out. Soon, the patient encounters nurse Heideltraut, a speedy nurse who thinks she treats her patients well and takes good care of them. But the care that she has in mind requires heavy monitoring and control, restricting the patients from doing anything she deems unnecessarily and simply annoying. Any patients who dare to do something that she deems inappropriate, she disciplines them like a child, hitting them so severely that they get thrown back a few feet. Well, for an uncooperative and adventurous protagonist, Heidel Trout deems shock therapy would be just the right treatment. After knocking the patient out and taking him to the shock therapy department, he encounters Nurse Anne, a very tall and down-to-business type of nurse holding two shock pads, twitching and getting shocked herself every so often, being the person who shocks the patients. Electric shock therapy was an aggressive way of treatment which declined in the 90s. 1970s, which consisted of shocking the patient's brain using electricity. Despite being a controversial treatment, it still is a valid way of treatment till now, most commonly being referred to as electroconvulsive therapy or ECT, which looks a little less barbaric than before, and is promoted as a tool which stimulates the patient's brain with brief control series of electrical pulses, causing a seizure within the brain that lasts approximately a minute. This treatment has been suggested to treat severe depression and bipolar disorder. There have been studies that it does treat depression, but on the other hand, there have been many studies that one of the most common side effects is memory loss. And of course, as it is a very aggressive treatment, it could lead to brain damage. Nersan instructs the protagonist to take a seat until his turn for the treatment. As she leaves, the protagonist quickly finds a way around her to find the maintenance key, finding another one of those notorious wall plugs using the key to access the maintenance room. In there, he turns off the electricity and tampers with the generators which causes Nersan to check on them, shocking herself unconscious. This allows the protagonist to collect her key and access the sick ward. Going back to the sick ward, the protagonist encounters a crawling patient who has soiled his pants, clearly being in a horrible state of care, begging him for a glass of water, after showing the protagonist the state of the restroom that he tried to use. If the protagonist fails to fetch him a glass of water, this patient, who is referred to as the neglected patient for clear reasons, tells on him with Nurse Heideltraut coming to sedate him with her special method, physical pain. Escaping the nurse, the protagonist explores the ward, finding excrement all over the place with all the patients being heavily sedated, depicting how horribly they are just put to sleep so the healthcare professionals don't have to bother with them, essentially being treated less than humans. Using the crowbar, the protagonist opens the planks barricading a door leading to the courtyard. The courtyard also has another wall plug, depicting how consistent it is throughout the clinic. In the yard, the protagonist meets the trash collector, a person who eats trash no matter what they are, whether recycling or not recycling. Moving on from the strange entity, the protagonist enters Dr. Hauser's library, a seemingly abandoned storage of all types of books with spider webs and dust, as if no one ever visits this place. Meeting an isolated Dr. Hauser in a condescending manner, he explains that this is a place for accumulation of knowledge and not a place for someone like the protagonist, being self-righteous and full of himself. Dr. Hauser seems to be an older doctor who has spent his life researching and writing, yet someone who prefers to keep his findings to himself instead of sharing them. In there, the protagonist can steal a key to progress further. If caught, Dr. Hauser gets enraged, finding out that someone has stolen from him. 
stomping on the protagonist so hard that the wooden floors beneath him crumble, sending him down to several floors under. To Dr. Hauser, his vast knowledge seems to only belong to him, as he doesn't want to give the credit to anyone else. He instead prefers his vast knowledge to die with him, rather than sharing it with others and lose the credit. This again portrays the selfishness of the medical professionals in the Hild Wild clinic of how majority of the healthcare professionals only care about themselves, fame and accomplishment, and not the main reason anyone should get into the medical field treating and helping vulnerable patients. On the other hand, if the protagonist decides to outmaneuver Dr. Hauser, he keeps appearing and teleporting in front of the protagonist through the maze-like library, as if he has supernatural abilities, knowing every nook and cranny of the place that he has trapped himself in for years. The protagonist manages to retrieve a teddy bear for Sleepy Doku, seemingly a patient which Dr. Hauser treats badly, despite clearly being mentally underdeveloped trying to force him to be an adult, having very high expectations of him. Helping Doku comes in handy later on in the game. Moving on, the protagonist enters the bathhouse, where he meets Wolfram, the lifeguard slash attendant of the bathhouse who has a very peculiar way of treating the patients. He makes all of the patients to fully undress without any undergarment, with all of them shaking like leaves and clearly not being comfortable. It appears as if he takes away their dignity and treats them badly, as if he has some sort of sadistic tendency. Strange things happen in the pool when the protagonist has a blackout and all the other patients disappear, with Wolfram chasing him to sedate him with a syringe. Running away from him and moving on, going to the cafeteria, which is accessible when Nurse Heidel Trout captures the protagonist without the crowbar, the protagonist encounters Chef Sewer, someone notorious for having the worst tasting food ever, rumored to take pleasure in making the patients suffer making such foods on purpose. On a table, speaking to the birthday patient, he begs the protagonist to sneak into the pantry and season the dish to make it more bearable. As it turns out, there are no pots or pans within the kitchen, and Chef Sewer serves the patients with his own flesh. As he is placed in a boiling pot, eternally boiling, and serving the soup of his own making from the pot that he is in. After sitting on the table and having a taste of this notorious soup, the protagonist cannot hold back from getting a severe nausea and passing out due to the extremely dizzying stench and taste of the food, explaining why the trash collector prefers to eat trash than the disgusting food of sewer. Waking back up in the courtyard, the protagonist finds an unfinished draft written by someone called Astrid, a member of the clinic who disagreed with Dr. Randolph becoming appointed the chief doctor role and pointed out so many mistakes in his research paper and always voiced how he is there only for fame and his name. Opening a dental ward within the clinic also portrayed how Randolph was obsessed with having his name out, even writing in his own journal how this would make him a recognizable person in the medical community. Moving on, going to a secret place with a long corridor, the protagonist reaches another plug which he can pull out this time around. Pulling the plug out, a mysterious gasp is heard followed by a mystical voice depicting that an entity has been imprisoned from the essence of the clinic, so these practitioners can do what they want with no limit. The voice explains that the medical practitioner stopped seeking this wise entity's advice and counsel and instead tried to silence it, portrayed in how it was hidden within the walls and being plucked. But no, you are here. You listen. It seems as if this entity is the essence of this clinic and healthcare, of the vows and the promises healthcare professionals make to do anything in their power to help people and patients. But unfortunately, this voice or entity has been kept oppressed with all the vows and promises dying. The voice continues that there are stones throughout this place which have ancient words to set guidance for those who want to follow. These words talk about how prevention is always better than cure and how the medical professionals should prevent disease as much as they can and not only seek cure. The words also indicate how there is art and human connection to the medical field than just science 
how warmth, sympathy, and understanding at times go much further and outweigh the surgeon's knife or the chemist's drug. For example, many times, the underlying cause of many mental health conditions are environmental, and simply reassurance, change of environment, positive reinforcement, and just simply listening help a lot more than aggressive treatments such as lobotomy or shock therapy. The writings which are in fact the oaths and vows the healthcare professional made carry on that they vow to work for the benefit of the sick avoiding overtreatment and therapeutic nihilism depicting how many of the healthcare professionals use the patients as subjects to do their own bidding for achieving fame or releasing their own frustration Another statue depicts how it is important to value other scientific finds from the past and continue in their footsteps and better them. And when they do better than them or discover new things, to share them so others can benefit from them. Clearly a hint at Dr. Hauser, who was so self-centered and in competition with Dr. Randolph that he prefers to die with his knowledge than to share it, just not to get the credit and praise. In another courtyard lies seven different marble statues, one standing as a judge being Dr. Frederick and the other six being the perpetrators, the people in the clinic whom each had a role in making the patient's lives miserable. As the writing is engraved in the statue, it reads how good is a broken oath, pointing to the oaths that they made to prioritize the patient's health and well-being physically and mentally. The statues belong to Nurse Anne from Shock Therapy Ward, Wolfram from the Bathhouse, Heidel Trout from the Sick Ward, Dr. Randolph, Dr. Hauser from the Library, and Chef Sower from the Cafeteria. The voice then goes on to talk about each individual. He explains how Wolfram is pretty from the outside, but that his soul was corrupted from the beginning, being very ambiguous to what he does. But from what was experienced, it seems as if he abuses and exploits the patients depicted in them having no clothes in the bathhouse, and then the protagonist being chased by him, being sedated. Nurse Anne, on the other hand, was a compassionate and kind person, being able to make everyone laugh, but unfortunately taking a profession such as shock therapy, which was deemed as unnecessary and even at times cruel, made her the subject of the voice's judgment. Heidel Trout was not always so cruel, but staying in the clinic for so long, she lost herself, and possibly due to her nature. She wanted solitude and silence, but due to so many patients complaining of pain and not being healthy, she became frustrated and abusive, constantly sedating the patient to the point of being unresponsive and even dying at times, to have the silence that she so badly needed. In fact, she seems to be past her work in time. As it appears, she only wants peace and quiet, neglecting patients who soil themselves and just simply sedating them, even going so far to doing unspeakable things to them to silence them and release her frustration. Randolph, on the other hand, seems to be the most vile, as even the voice stays quiet about him, as since the beginning he was corrupted and only entered this profession for a name and fame. Dr. Hauser, on the other hand, has always been a very intelligent and wise man, discovering many new things and finding breakthroughs which would help the medical community and advance science several decades. But his sense of competition and protection for his valuable discoveries and assets, he had them, not for anyone to access them, essentially withholding information which could save so many. And finally, Edward Sewer, the chef, being a sad and miserable creature who is doomed to boil forever, serving his own flesh to vulnerable patients. It seems as if he on purpose poisons patients and makes them sick, with many dying, taking pleasure in it, and why he is trapped with his own misery there in the kitchen to suffer with his own sickness and evil. Moving on, running away from the omnipresent evil force, the opposing power to this wise voice, the protagonist enters the patient's hall. There, two nurses, Astrid and Helen, are stationed where they take care of the patients. Astrid, as we heard from before, was a nurse who actually cared about patients and the rules that were set there to protect them. Unfortunately, Astrid is not seen as it's not her shift, but on the other hand, 
Nurse Helen is seen, who seems to be having supersonic speed, attending to each patient, refusing to help the protagonist until her break, depicting what a wonderful and caring nurse she is, that she magically attends to all of the patients, something that seems to be impossible. This is a fresher and a very welcome change in the clinic, as not all healthcare professionals are corrupt or bad, and clearly, in the patient's hall, the nurses Astrid and Helen in influence each other to be better and actually do their job, being good to the patients. During her break, Helen explains how she is working twice more, even taking Astrid's shifts, saying that she hasn't been showing up. This might be a hint that her disagreement with Randolph made her disappear without a sign, as if she has been killed or removed from the clinic without anyone's knowledge. Helen asks the protagonist to fetch her two special medications as she is unable to leave due to having so many patients to take care of, being such a wonderful nurse. The protagonist goes to the old ward to fetch the medicine when she encounters the iron lung patient with arms only sticking out. What's interesting is that person or entity is actually holding the medicine offering it to the protagonist, as of trying to help the patients in the patient's hall and help Helen. After fetching the medicine, the wise voice appears, explaining that this horrifying scene is of no one else but nurse Astrid, someone who dared to speak against all the misconduct and cruelty against the patients, which resulted in her becoming what is seen here, an oppressed person inside an iron lung to suffer for the rest of her life. This is a horrifying depiction of how monsters and evil people try to silence the good or opposing voices, not to hear that they are monsters, and unfortunately for Astrid, that's the unfair result of her kindness and bravery. Even in this condition, suffering every single second, she wants to help the patients and Helen. As the protagonist provides Nurse Helen with the medications that she needed, she takes a longer break as her patients all have been attended to, taking the protagonist to the High Wild Park. Nurse Helen explains that the giant structure seen at the end of the park is the dental ward commissioned by Dr. Randolph, which is more of a torture chamber than a dental clinic. A place without windows and massive ventilation shafts all over the park, which let out foul odor and steam, as if Dr. Randolph is doing no good in the shady dental clinic that he founded. Finally going to the dental facility, the selfishness and arrogance of Dr. Randolph is instantly seen, on how he has decorated this place with his own marble statues, as it's the only place that he could do as such without Dr. Frederick's statues. In there, the impatient nurse Sabine attends to the protagonist who informs him to follow her for his dental preparation, examination, and treatment, and based on what we have seen and heard so far, this will probably not be a dental treatment. The dental office has a bed with a theater around it, as if Dr. Randolph performs live experiments and surgeries here for people to see, trying to have breakthroughs through cruel experiments on the vulnerable patients. As soon as the protagonist lies on the bed, Nurse Sabine straps him to the bed, putting a strange, menacing contraption on his head and face. This equipment continues to apply extreme and immense pressure on the jaw and head of the protagonist, as if being more of a tortured device than anything else, and Nurse Sabine seems to be sadistically taking pleasure in doing so and inflicting pain on the protagonist. Nurse Sabine stops putting more pressure on the protagonist, saying that she made a lot of mess already and that he is ready for Dr. Randolph to see him, probably being mutilated now. Dr. Randolph comes to the theater room just to be a monstrosity, a mixture of experimental tools, as if depicting that he is the product of his own anger, self-righteousness, hunger for fame, and cruel experiments. The voice explains how he has become as such due to his desires of being famous and experimenting on patients, being a curse, and a sickness with no cure. Just like Chef Sower, he is the product of his sinister desires, depicted to be what he is inside. A monster, a mechanical being who wants to run tests and experiments. The voice says his sickness and desires have infected everyone around him and himself, 
including the voice and the protagonist, and that it needs to end when he falls through a deep hole down in the middle of the courtyard with all the statues, with a pool of blood forming around him, seemingly killing him, while being watched by all the perpetrators and Dr. Frederick. The surreal journey ends with the ambiguity rising to who the voice is and why it mentioned that Randolph's sickness specifically infected the voice and the protagonist, and who the protagonist truly is. There's no question that the Heilwild Clinic was once a very well-known place for healing and treatment, overseen by Dr. Frederick with his statues all over the place acting as a testimony for his greatness and how he acted as a mentor and supervisor to ensure the place runs as it's supposed to, with all the medical professionals upkeeping their vows and oaths. However, as time passes, Dr. Frederick is replaced by Randolph, a fame-hungry, self-driven individual who is in this profession just to become well-known in the medical community. The clinic goes into a state of neglect, with all the other professionals giving in to their corruptness. Randolph even goes so far as creating a structure he refers to as the dental clinic while in fact he tries to perform controversial and frowned upon procedures to advance science very quickly in his own way. As Helen describes it, the structure acts as corruption in the once beautiful park, with massive vents letting out steam and foul odor. It seems as if Dr. Randolph performs inhumane experiments within these facilities, using vulnerable patients who have no one and cannot stand up for themselves. That is why there are no windows, so no one can see the outside or within this horrifying torture chamber. The aftermath, suffering under such horrendous procedures to clear any evidence of his crimes and atrocities, Randolph burns the victims, hence why the steam and the bad odor. The game in general was depicted in a surreal and metaphoric way, and Randolph can be seen devolved and transformed into a mechanical monster, seen through what he truly is within. A psychotic monster who is obsessed with getting a name for himself quickly within the medical community, doing anything to achieve that, including unspeakable experiments, essentially becoming a product of his sinister desires, dismissing all the vows that he made. The voice, on the other hand, could be the essence of this clinic and the good that it stood for. But it was silenced and plugged shut as the healthcare professionals decided to give in to their frustration and evil, selfish desires. The voice acting as the soul of this place stood silent and restrained, watching the horror from close by. The protagonist on the other hand, towards the end, is revealed to be someone Randolph had personally impacted, including the voice, being something so close to him. In my opinion, the protagonist seems to be the conscience of Randolph, who is powerless to what is happening and can only witness the horror. However, at the end, he manages to overcome the selfish desires of Randolph and kill the bad side, thrown into a hole observed by all the statues. That's why the voice pleaded with the protagonist that there might still be time to fix things. So the voice could be the combination of the vows and oaths and the essence of healthcare and the clinic, including the wisdom of Frederick and his teachings, pleading with the conscience of Randolph to be a better version of himself. <laughs>